You're listening to Titular Characters with your host, the adorable Eva Webb. My babies, in this issue, we're featuring the incomparable Heather Antos. Heather is an award-winning comic book editor and writer known for her work on Marvel's Star Wars, Deadpool Lines, Images Redlands, Injection, The Bitter Root, as well as one of the co-creators of Gwenpool. She is presently the senior editor for Valiant Entertainment. And she's here with us today, right now, and ready to talk about comics. How are you, Heather? I'm great. How are you? I am loving life. You know, for a Thursday, uh, I am in really, really good shape, feeling just uh, really with it today. Um, so little birdie tells me that, uh, that you have an exciting project. Yeah, yeah. So after much ado, no thanks to COVID (laughs) and delaying the industry, um, this Wednesday, April 28th, The Amazing Shadow Man number one will finally be on sale from Valiant Comics at a local comic shop near a year, written by Colin Bunn, drawn by John Davis Hunt, colors by Jordi Belair, letters by Clayton Coles. I am so stoked to get this book finally out there. It sounds amazing. What's it about? Um, so Shadow Man is, uh, he's a character from the Valiant universe, but you don't really need to know anything about Valiant or Shadow Man to pick this book up. It's a great book for for newcomers. It'll tell you everything you need to know. Um, he is a man from New Orleans who has a strange family legacy. And that family legacy is that they are tied to the Shadow Loa, um, an entity from the dead side and voodoo lore that will give him supernatural abilities. Um, and his job is basically to protect the world of the living from the world of the dead. Um, so, you know, sometimes, sometimes those dead things want to crawl over to our side and uh, we can't have that. Can we? But this is just uh, sort of a, another in a long line of uh, just really exciting Valiant titles. Uh, the last couple of years, they have just been uh, absolutely amazing. How does the how does the magic happen at Valiant? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a great group of editors there, uh, and everyone brings a little bit of their own, you know, interest and expertise to things. I myself am a huge, huge horror fan, and so. Uh, when I joined Valiant, the character of Shadow Man just seemed like a natural fit for me to explore and, and do some horror stories. But uh, like any connected, massive universe, uh, there's a lot of collaboration that happens behind the scenes to make sure that everything is kind of going in the same general direction and um, keeping everything consistent and exciting. Uh, lots, lots of meetings. <laughs> So what's it like being an editor for one of the larger indie comics companies? Working for every publisher is is more or less the same, just with different characters. You know, at, at least for me, I I want to keep my head down and, and make comics and make some cool comics. And luckily, I, I've gotten to do a lot of that in my career. And um, there's always a fun, fun, quote unquote, balance between Obviously, you work for a publisher and a company, and their job at the end of the day is to make money. And so um, you do have to keep that in mind about what's marketable, what's sellable, um, while still trying to experiment and bring in new voices. And so there's a lot of give and take and a lot of um, strategy that comes into play uh, with making smart decisions therein, you know, not everything can be super esoteric, right? At the end of the day, you still have to have your, uh, Hollywood popcorn blockbuster movies, just like you have to have your Hollywood popcorn blockbuster comics that, that will sell to a more general casual audience. And then to the, for sure money, I guess you could say, 
uh, and then do your fun experimental stuff. And, and hopefully those will work out in your favor too. But I, I love what I do. I love getting to work with characters and create stories that fans love. Um, and, you know, really getting to connect with, with them. That's, that's my favorite thing, you know, back when comic conventions were a thing, there was nothing better than, you know, meeting a father and him introducing his daughter to me and, and thanking me for creating a book that, you know, he could read with his little girl. Like that's, that's, that's life, you know, that's everything. That has got to be an amazing feeling just, just in general. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. It's, it's, you know, seeing the first time I saw a little girl cosplay as Gwenpool, it was the best day. I love Gwenpool. Gwenpool is such a great, you know, entertaining, just brilliantly inspired character. Just, just overall. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So how did you, uh, how did you get your start? In, uh, in the comics industry? Um, yeah. So I've always been really interested in comics. Um, you know, my mom will say I wrote and drew my own comics before I knew <laughs> what comics were. Uh, but I didn't actually really start reading comics until much later in life. I didn't have a local corner store comic shop or anything like that to go to. All I had was comic strips in the newspaper. But it wasn't until I had an American literature class um, later in my school years that I was introduced to books like Hellblazer and Sandman, Why the Last Man Transmetropolitan, a lot of your classic vertigo um, from the golden age of those those books. And I just fell in love. There was something so magical about the endless abilities of visual creative storytelling that it was limitless, you know. The, the, the budget was the creator's imagination. And there's some really great things to be done there. And it was when I read the 24 hour diner issue from Sandman, I think it was volume. I think that's volume one issue six, if I have that correct. Um, And it's just an impeccably crafted issue, both standalone, but within the series itself. And I read it and, and I, and I knew I was like, I want to do this. This is, this is something I want to do and I want to be interested in. Um, and from there I started reading more books and that led to writing for various comic journalism sites and interviewing creators. Um, but it wasn't until I was about to graduate college and trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life that a friend said to me, Heather, you like comics why don't you just do that? And that's when I realized like, oh yeah, people make money doing this, right? There there are careers for this. And I really began pursuing what different options there were for me. And I knew I didn't want to write. I was, I, I, you know, I, I like to write, but I'm not a writer. I like to draw, but I'm not an artist. But there's this credit editor on every single book that was mysterious to me. And I had a vague idea of what an editor and, you know, your traditional publishing houses do. But in comics, there's so much more that goes on. There's an artist and a colorist and a letterer and and so many other people that you're working with. Like, what exactly is the role of an editor? And so I did what any good millennial does. And I started reaching out via Twitter to different comic editors. And that's how I met Jordan White, who agreed to speak with me at C2E2 in 2014 um, and give me a bit of an idea of what it is an editor's job is in the day-to-day, especially for one of the big two. And I left that convention knowing this is it. This is what I want to do. I I want to learn how to be a comic editor. I had already graduated college at that point. So getting an internship at one of the big two was out of the question um, as they require you to get college credit to apply. Um, and I wasn't about to make the move from Michigan to New York city without a job in the hopes that maybe I would, I would get, get, um, an assistant editor position. Um, so I decided to self publish and start from the ground up, um, doing editing for free for other indie, uh, creator owned self publishing endeavors. And I created my own comics anthology that I put together Um, and crowdfunded on Kickstarter and self-published as a sort of portfolio resume builder piece. And it was that book that six months later caught the eye of Jordan White at Marvel again. And they happened to be hiring at the time. He asked if I wanted to apply. I did. And 
the rest is history. You got to work with some amazing people at Marvel too. You've got Jordan White, uh, you know, Tom Brevoort, um, just some just incredible minds. Uh, is it hard not to, uh, not to fangirl a little? Oh my goodness. I won't lie. My, so one of my interviews at Marvel, I didn't know who I was interviewing with. I was just told, you know, phone interview this time, be ready. And the phone rings and on the other end is Tom Brevoort. And at that point, all I knew Tom Brevoort for was he's been at Marvel for forever. He's a big deal. He, you know, like he's, he basically is Marvel. And I was so nervous. I couldn't tell you anything that happened in that interview at all. But I was so stressed out that the second I hung out, I burst into tears <laughs> because I was so afraid. I just like ruined my shot <laughs> in front of Tom Breaver on the phone, which is so funny now because like I, I know Tom personally and he's very sweet and lovely. But yeah, no, I mean, I learned very quickly that you know, in order to be taken seriously as an editor, you you have to be a colleague first with the creators that you're working with, you know, fan second. And it's, it's okay to say, you know, oh, I really like this book that you worked on. I thought it was fantastic, but you don't want that to be the identity of your relationship. And one of the first books I worked on at Marvel um, one of the first inter- creator interactions I had was with Mark White and Terry Dodson. And oh my God, the imposter syndrome was real. you know, my first week, you want me to send these notes to Mark Wade? Absolutely not, you know, but I did and I had to. And, you know, it it was kind of a sink or swim situation where you kind of have to get over that very quickly. At least I, that was my experience and what I felt I had to do. And yeah, uh, (laughs) it definitely, my, my first years at Marvel, my first year or so, I was definitely like, oh my God, who am I? You know, I'm a baby 24 year old, but now, you know, they're old friends, which, which is really great. But what does uh, an editor do? What's their uh, responsibility? I like to say they're a part-time creative director, part-time project manager, full-time therapist. Therapist, really? Oh yeah. Artists are some of the most, artists and writers are some of the most, you know, insecure. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but just, you know, Is this good enough? Am I all right? Uh, And you have to keep in mind, like most writers and artists, they work from home. They don't have a lot of social interaction, especially in the year of COVID-19, you know, and it's so important to be able to be that calming voice that can, you know, get them to deliver their best work um, and reassure them and coach them and, and really, truly just just to get them to deliver and, and especially on creator owned projects, you know, there's a lot of creator owned projects where people are just nervous. They're, it's their babies and they're putting it out to the world and being able to be that voice of reason for them is very helpful. But yeah, I'm, I, an editor in my opinion is, the closest comparison is um, to a TV or film producer. You know, your it's your job to solicit ideas, find the best ideas, and bring those ideas to life um, with the best, you know, uh, creators that you can, the right creators for the project. Hit your budgets and hit your deadlines and do it for, you know, 15 to 20 different projects at the same time every single month. There's there's a lot of moving parts. A lot is going on. Or if you're into sports metaphor, I always like to say you're a team captain. You know, I don't like to say you're the coach because you should be in the trenches with your creators. It's your deadline, too. And and you need to be able to call the shots as you see them on the field as it's happening. One thing I've always been curious about is, uh, you know, when when you're in indie publishing, it takes people years to produce maybe three issues of a comic. How do you get that schedule to compress when you're working on monthly books? I always try and plan ahead as much as I can. That's not always possible. Sometimes, you know, sometimes this this happened on more than one occasion at Marvel. Sales will decide literally the day before the previous catalog is going to print that, oh, we're going to manifest and create a brand new book. And so you have to come up with a creative team and pitch a concept and a cover overnight, quite literally. And, wow, you know, your, your series is already behind schedule at that point. 
um, which is not ideal. So obviously those situations, you have to be a bit more creative with, with scheduling in order to make things work. But that's how you get projects like You Are Deadpool, which is an Al Ewing Deadpool miniseries in which different artists drew the whole thing. But that was planned and part of the story in order to make it work because sales wanted a book, you know, so last minute that we were able to build a schedule with different talent to make it make as much sense as possible. (laughs) But, you know, when it came to working on licensed properties like Star Wars with Lucasfilm, because every, you know, the comics exist in the same universe that the films happen and films are planned out, film and TV are planned out so far in advance. We knew well ahead of time when most things were happening. And so we got to build out schedules very, very far in advance in order to, as best we can, work with Lucasfilm approval times. But also, you know, I got to go to an artist and say like, hey, how much time do you need to draw an issue? Is that six weeks? Is that four weeks? Whatever it is. And then I can build a schedule to accommodate that rather than, sorry, you only have three weeks to draw this issue. Good luck. You know, the the benefits of indie publishing and creator own self and, and self-published work is you don't necessarily have the crunch of a Marvel or DC, you know, timeline. You don't have to announce that you're doing anything until it's done. But when it comes to compressing that timeline in order to, to produce work faster, that's, you know, you never want to burn out or kill yourself, right? If you're working a full-time job, um, then going home and staying up for six hours is just not ideal and healthy and, and a very very great way to make yourself sit. So I always say, don't rush anything, take things at your own pace and figure out truly too, what motivates you in order to, to get the work done. And sometimes that is literally just forcing yourself to get the work done. Cause we all have those days where we get home from work and then just don't want to do anything. I know I do. (laughs) You know, that's, that's super important, you know, self-care with a hectic job like this, you know, just so many things going in and out in every direction. Where do you find your zen? I love chaos. Um, I'm definitely someone who who sees sees the calm and the chaos for sure. I'm very strategic and plan oriented, and you know when someone throws a wrench into my plan, I I'm a chess player, right? I always have like three other options and backup plans in my head. So, but for literal zen, I am a big, 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 big yoga fan. I do yoga every single day and meditate in my mornings to start my day off. And I also am a huge fan of taking breaks and taking walks just to like step away from the computer and like reset the brain to come back with a fresh look. So how do you cast a, a comic in a way to get the uh, the best collaborations possible? Is there a science to it or, or is it an art? Uh, it's a little bit of both. You know, I like to call comics alchemy it's which is a bit of a science and an art you throw a bunch of things into a pot and hope what comes out is gold and you know you can work with you know writer a artist b colorist c on one project and it wins all the eisners and the highest sales records of all time and then work with literally the same team on another project and no one picks up the book, right? There's that je ne sais quoi, there's that X factor about projects that you just never know what will hit when. And that's not to say that something needs to sell a million copies in order to to be considered a good book. That's We know that's not true. There are plenty of amazing books that just didn't hit the right audience or didn't hit the internet at the right time or, or, or you know, had... It, it, timing is, is such a huge thing that it's just unfortunately out of a lot of control. But with experience comes an understanding of these sort of things and, and how we can work with it and what creators will work best on what sort of properties or with each other. One of the things I love the most about comics, and I think what makes it so exciting for me is that you can take 20 different artists and give them the exact same prompt and you're going to get 20 different pictures. And that's so cool. There's there's no other other industry that you can get something like that. And and I think that's really really exciting. Do you have a thought on uh, on paper versus digital? Is planning one or the other different in the things you have to do in the execution? Um, yes and no. 
There, there are a few differences. Like, obviously, you don't have to account for the time it takes to send a book to print and then go from the printer to the warehouse. You know, you don't have to worry about what time that is. Um, when it comes to digital, a lot of times you can literally hit submit 24 hours before it's on sale, which is not ideal. <laughs> you know, like it would, I would never ever, ever suggest anyone do anything up to the wire like that. But it happens all the time. And honestly, the technical stuff is where things are different. And that's more on a production standpoint. From an editorial standpoint, I always say it helps for us to know definitely ahead of time whether something will be meant for digital or meant for print, because for print, you can, you have to keep in mind page turns and double page spreads and making sure all of that stuff will be laid out correctly. Someone reads a book and it's not all messed up. Um, But when it comes to digital, you know, there's, depending on which platform you're using, there are a lot of different opportunities and options to enhance your storytelling. You know, like Webtoons has the scrolling feature where you can literally just have a single panel that's very, very long that you scroll through. Or there are opportunities where it's guided view and it moves you along the page. And there's some cool storytelling things that you can do with that, that you can experiment with, or you can do something digital, very, very straightforward. Um, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that, but it's, it's all something I think that is important to know ahead of time. That way you and your creators can be on the same page about what the final product will look like and and how to navigate that. How do you approach diversity and representation as an editor? I think that we're we're past the time of hearing the same stories by the same voices over and over. There there is Unfortunately, like I said before, a balance between this is a company and it has to make money, but also it's super important for us to elevate new voices and tell new stories. And and so it's very important that, especially now, if we're going to be telling the story about the experience of a marginalized community or a marginalized character, that experience needs to be told from someone with that background and that experience. That's not to say that a white man can't write a a story about a character who's black. That's totally fine. But that white writer shouldn't be writing about the black experience. And, And it's those things to keep in mind as an editor, you know, who is telling these stories? What is this story about? But then also, if you're doing a story where there's a stadium, you know, full of thousands of people, have some, <laughs> there's there's more than just men in this world. There's more than just white people in this world, you know? Like diversity exists in backgrounds too and and it's it's so important. It's so important for people to have stories about themselves in their media in their entertainment. You know, that is a big reason of why I got into this industry was because when I was growing up, I didn't have characters that looked like me that I wanted to to learn about. You know, the only women in superhero comics were always in spandex with their, and they never wore pants, you know? Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it's true. It, it's so true. I, I just did a, a conversation with someone earlier today where the first character I ever felt comfortable enough cosplaying was Black Canary from the CW Arrow show. And it was because she wore pants. Literally, that was why I wanted to cosplay her was because she was badass and wore pants. And my God, how sad is that? But yeah, and and so, you know, being able to have, you know, co-created Gwenpool or worked on characters like Dr. Afra and have girls tell me like I now like Star Wars and this was my gate gateway or father saying like finally a character I can read with my little girl like that's huge that it, that is so 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 huge you know and and Moon Girl Double Dinosaur like that's a book with with Luna like I wish I had a comic book about a superhero girl who loved science and her pet dinosaur as a kid like, where, where was that book when I was growing up, you know? And so the fact that these things are starting to exist and, and are being pushed for it internally now rather than just externally is massive and super exciting. And I cannot wait to see where the industry is five years, 10 years, 20 years from now in this regard. How do you feel about the, uh, the indie comics renaissance that's going on right now? I love it. I love that there are more comics than ever 
Um, I love that there's more than just superhero comics. You know, as I said before, I love horror comics. I'm a big fan of crime. Um, and I love, I love like the YA slice of life movement that's happening now. I think there is never anything wrong with more comics. Keep them coming. So in this greater field with so much out there, how do you make a book stand out from the crowd? I think having a very, very strong high concept is huge. Something where a reader can immediately picture what the story is. You know, for a book at Valiant that I've been working on called The Final Witness, it is what if Superman had to hunt a serial killer, you know, and and it's a crime book. Having those high concepts is, is a huge deal. Having big name creators obviously helps sell or having a big character. Tom, Tom Brevoort has a saying that he said at Marvel for a book in order to be marketable, you have to have at least two of the three C's creator character and concept. You know, if you have a great concept in Batman, then you can use a lesser known creator. But if you only have Batman, well, there's a million other Batman books that they're going to read, right? You need either a create a, a big name creator that we want to read Batman on or a Batman concept that we've never seen before. And so I always keep the three C's in mind whenever I put a book together in order to help make sure it's marketable. So are you still reading comics like uh, as a fan? Absolutely. I, I unfortunately don't get to read as much as I'd like to. Um, but, you know, I definitely, definitely am still reading. I actually during the pandemic have gone back to reread a bunch of the old school vertigo stuff that got me into comics in the first place. And it's been really fun to like read them now as a professional rather than just like someone being introduced to them in college. Does the experience of creating comics in your opinion change the way you experience comics as a fan? I think so. Um, a little bit. I definitely know how the sausage gets made. And so there's a lot of times where, and especially knowing different creator habits or editorial habits or even publisher habits, you know, I will know why they can't do something that I'd like to see them do with a character because they're just not going to use that. They're they're not going to do this thing with that character or this, this publisher and this writer don't get along, which is why that writer doesn't work there anymore. X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, I know, I know the behind the scenes politics with stuff that can sometimes get in the way of, of enjoying a book just purely as a fan. But also I think it makes it more interesting to see from a critical thinking point of view, like when big events happen at publishers, like one of the, one of the things that I was really interested in was a couple years ago when DC was moving from New York to LA, they did this big month long event uh, that kind of filled the space of all the chaos of moving that, you know, 30 years from now, no one reading those books will, will know of, right? It's just a books that they read that came out. But from someone being in the industry and knowing what's going on at the time, it definitely made the understanding of the product very interesting. Do you have a, a favorite comic of all time? Oh, it's definitely that Sandman issue that I talked about from when it comes to single issues. The the 24-hour diner issue. Uh, again, I believe it's it's issue 6 of volume 1, but also my favorite graphic novel of all time is called One Soul. It's by Ray Fox. It's put out um by Oni and it's it's I don't really know how to explain it aside from it's like poetry meets comics. Um, It tells a story about 18 different people throughout the span of their lives and how really they have more in common than they do different. And it's, it's truly beautiful. And I've never seen another comic story told in a similar way. It's, it's great. I highly, highly recommend it. Is there a creator that you think is either the most underrated or uh, most inspiring person in comics? Oh my goodness. Um, I don't know. I mean, she's not underrated, but she's certainly been very inspiring to me is uh, Karen Berger, who used to, she's a creator of Vertigo back in the day. And, and really um, she is why creator owned comics and indie comics exist in the, in the way that they do today. I, I fully, fully accredit that to her. You know, she, started vertigo and because of that we have books like watchmen and v for vendetta and 
you know, uh, 100 Bullets and Sandman and Hellblazer. And, you know, because of the success of those books, that's why in the 90s, a bunch of the creators like Jim Lee, Robert Kirkman, Tom McFarlane, Rob Liefeld all went and started Image. And, you know, Image is where creators want to go to create their own stories that aren't Marvel and DC now. It's huge. The impact of her work is, is massive. And I hope to have a fraction of the impact that she has had on the industry. So we're up against the, uh, the end of the show and uh, the final segment, I I don't have a name for it anymore. I used to call it the, uh, the fun and interesting questions. (laughs) Are you ready? Subtle. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so what's your favorite food? Um, ice cream. Would you say you're a, uh, a cat or a dog person? Oh, a dog person, hands down. My dog is, my dog is literally sitting here waiting for me to finish so I can take her out. <laughs> what's the best swear word? The best swear word? Ooh, definitely fuck. There, it's, it's very versatile, I think. That's a good one. What inspires you? Oh, God, that's a big question. Um, I I would say it's probably cheesy, but like, you know, uh, making things better, you know, leaving leaving a a better future than than you had. Um, Not that that's always possible and in your hands because there's a lot more at play in the universe than um, but definitely, you know, creating hope and and inspiring other people. I love that answer. That is amazing. What brings you joy? Uh, just the little things. Just, you know, like my dog being cute um, and showing me her belly. You know, like she knows she's in trouble. And, you know, just, just making other people smile and appreciating, you know, being able to take a step back and appreciate the little things and the little beauties in life and, and just existing and being. And, and I think that's really important, especially in times like we've just been experiencing where we haven't been able to see friends and family, you know, like really appreciating those little moments and, and just holding on to them, I think is very important. So you've got one altruistic wish to save the world. What's it going to be? I don't know. World peace. (laughs) Make everyone get along. There you go. That's workable. Okay, so you wake up one morning and you are imbued with superpowers. What are those powers and uh, how how do you choose to use them? Um, this kind of goes in hand with the last one. Uh, so I always wanted the ability to be able to understand anyone and anything. And what I mean by understand is not just like, oh, I can speak any language, but like really understand intent and motivation and what is emotionally, you know, being able to emotionally understand, um, everyone else that way we can fully communicate better. So, uh, so what's the next big thing you've got coming down the line? Well, the next big thing is I recently announced that I uh, actually uh, had my last day at Valiant and I will be starting uh, when this comes out. Uh, I will be starting at IDW where I will be back working on Star Wars and back working on Marvel properties for their YA and middle grade comics. And it's very exciting. No kidding. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've heard people you've worked with that have said that you were like the nerd of nerds when it comes to Star Wars, that you just know everything about it. Yeah, I'm a huge, 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 huge Star Wars fan, she says as she looks at her wall of Star Wars Funko Pops. Um, I No, I love Star Wars so much. I think it's the best. And it's funny, I growing up, I was in a group of huge Star Wars nerds that I think are even nerdier than me at Star Wars. So I never considered myself to be a huge Star Wars nerd. I always thought I was like a casual Star Wars fan. And then I got to Marvel, which is literally a house of nerds, all nerdy people. And I realized like 
how much I knew versus them. And that's when I realized like, oh no, like I am legit a Star Wars nerd. Like I, I taught myself to read Arabesh, which is the Star Wars alphabet and write it. And, and yeah, that should have been my sign yeah. that I'm a huge Star Wars nerd, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So Heather, uh, that's it. That's everything we got for the show. Um, where can people find you online? Uh, easiest way to find me is Twitter, where I am always lurking. My name at Twitter is literally just my name, at Heather Antos. You can also find me on Instagram at, at Heather Antos and at Heather Art Toast, A-R-T-O-S, where I post all my little doodles and drawings that I do. Um, and then if you ever want to get in touch, you can reach out to me via my contact page at my website at www.heatherantos.com. Hello, my babies. It's time to close the show. I just wanted to say thank you for being the most awesome people in the universe. Thank you for contributing and making this show possible. Thank you for listening and giving us your feedback. And thank you for being beautiful, valid, and living your best life. We had another contribution this week from Cheshire 2050. He said... Stay adorable. This is Brad, and we all know that Brad is awesome. Like one of the nicest people ever. Thanks, Brad. If you would like to contribute to the show, just visit buymeacoffee.com slash Eva is adorable. Because I am. All donations go towards the cost of production, and they are always appreciated. Titular Characters is a show about the things we love and the people that make the magic happen. It's produced and hosted by the adorable Eva Webb. That's me. Sound design by Eva Webb. Also me. And we're still looking for a new sound person, so DM me on Twitter for details if you're interested. Opening theme by Antonia Marquis. Closing theme by Mikey Flash of Speed Force Music. And that's it, my babies. Join us next time for another death-defying adventure in cyberspace. Oh, and when you do, bring candy. Love yes. <laughs> <laughs>